Welcome to this video on contribution to knowledge and originality in a doctoral dissertation. My name is uh, Cecile Bardenhorst and I'm in the Faculty of Education at Memorial University. Just a note that I have many other videos on re research writing, thesis writing, dissertation writing and a number of videos on writing the literature review chapter. Um, please have a look out for those. The purpose of this video is to explain for doctoral writers um, what contribution to knowledge and originality in a thesis is. Now, of course, you know, you're all in different disciplines and departments, so you will need to find out from your department or discipline what examiners want to see. I'm going to talk generally and really what I'm, I'm doing is giving you ideas of things that you can think about um, in order to pull this out in your thesis. So the purpose of the video is to go through what is originality, what does contribution to knowledge mean, how does one justify originality and contribution to knowledge and how is it written up in a thesis. And um, these questions come from somebody who made a comment in the comment box, and I'm sorry I've forgotten your name, but um, these were your questions and I'm going to answer them now. So um, usually people start thinking about originality at the end of their thesis, and this is when the supervisor or your committee will say, well, you need to show your contribution. And at that point you're exhausted, um, you have thesis fatigue and you are so tired of this project and you think, I don't think I've made any contribution at all. Uh, you feel like it's all been done by somebody else and it's all been done much better. But really this is because you are at this end point and it's difficult for you to see something new. And it's often really useful to get um, a new viewpoint, you know, to get somebody else who hasn't seen your thesis to tell you what is good about it, because at that point you might not see it. Um, but originality and contribution to knowledge doesn't mean that your thesis has to present something totally innovative or something that's previously unknown or completely groundbreaking. Really, we talk, we're talking about, um, you know, along a continuum increments of originality. But one of the key things that I want to show you in here is um, that often what uh, doctoral writers do is they assume that the reader will be able to see the relevance. So often they know what the relevance and the originality is, but they don't state it explicitly because they feel that it should be obvious to everyone. But it really isn't obvious to everyone and you have to articulate it. Um, and it, you have to articulate it in a way that may seem to you, you are repeating yourself or you are um, blowing your own horn, right? You're being, um, um, <laughs> I don't know how to express it, but you, you really do have to be quite strong in the articulation of your contribution to knowledge because um, that your reader won't see it unless you point it out. So I'm going to show you a number of ways that you can think about your contribution, originality and your contribution to knowledge. So where the number is, um, there'll be a, a, range, a, a theme, let's say. But what I really think you should do is in your thesis, think about something you can say about each of these themes. Now, in, in some, with some topics, some of the themes will be more important than others, but when you are finishing off your thesis and you want to really work on this, go through each of these themes and say to yourself, well, what have I contributed in terms of this particular theme? So the first one is a conceptual or a theoretical contribution. So have you done something theoretically or conceptually that is slightly new, slightly different, adding to the literature? Um, maybe you've adapted a conceptual framework or you've developed a new one. Maybe you've just used a conceptual framework in a new context. Um, maybe you are applying a theory in a way that hasn't been applied before. So it doesn't have to be a huge thing. It can be a slight thing. But you need to think about it and then think about how you can write that up. Knowledge gap contributions. So 
Have you advanced thinking in your field in some way? It doesn't have to be huge again. Have you carried an argument further? Have you developed new insights um, added to someone else's thinking? So go back to your knowledge gap and show how you have filled that gap. Perhaps you've taken this research to a new cohort or a new context. Methodological contributions. Have you used unique or unusual methods or adapted existing research methods in a new way? You know, perhaps instead of just doing one methodology, you've used a number of different methods. And that's a contribution because you've combined these methods uh, in this particular context. You know, maybe you've used a known material or issue in new ways, or you're applying, you know, old ideas in a new context. Uh, maybe your data sources are original in some way. But think about how you can write about your methodological contribution. Now, unexpected results is something that I find that most people will think about. But it's worth having, you know, um, a section on unexpected results things that didn't um, turn out the way you expected, or something that maybe has changed your thinking. So as a researcher, has something happened in the research process that you can comment on, and maybe that will be a contribution to knowledge as well. The significance of your conclusions. Now, generally, people do this one really well, and this is what they focus on when it comes to finding a contribution. But what I'm saying is that all the other components, the theory, the methodology, the knowledge gap, all of those can also be contributions. When it comes to the significance of your conclusions, again, you have to articulate the significance of them. And there are several ways that you can do this. So once you've done the analysis, you will develop close findings. Those close findings can be significant, as well as the conclusions that you draw later on. Those conclusions can be um, contributions too. So there are two sets of conclusions, the close findings, as well as the bigger meta-conclusions that you draw about the study as a whole. And each of those can be separate contributions to knowledge. A new knowledge could also mean that you are integrating things in a particular way or you're adding, adapting, or even creating something. And again, it doesn't have to be all new and it doesn't have to be totally original. So I guess you have to be quite innovative in the way you think about this. So when it comes to your meta-conclusions, this is where you also have to, um, this is your contribution, um, you know, this is your substantive contribution. And it's often a forgotten part of the thesis, the meta-conclusion. So these are not your close findings, but this is where you take a step back and you say, okay, now that I've done this study, what does it mean? And what I say to my students is just find three conclusions. And initially they're saying to me, well, I can't think of anything. But the more you think about it, the more you'll be able to come up with three things that um, you can now say now that you've done this study. And then you might want to have um, a section where you evaluate the research project. And this is, you know, often people will have a limitation section. But what really, what this is about really is um, what worked and what didn't work. And what would you do differently? And that can be a contribution to knowledge. So, you know, if you learnt a huge amount in the research process because things didn't work out, then that can be um, a big contribution to future research. So you don't want to undermine your study and, and to say this was a waste of time. But you want to say, you know, now that I've done this, what I would do differently is X, Y, and Z, and that would yield, you know, other results. And that understanding is really important for future research. Then you could also have um, policy or practice you know, real world, that's what I'm talking about, is now the real world um, contributions. So recommendations, policies, practice, or, or um, recommendations for practice or policy. You know, if this is part of your research and you're in a field where you can do this, then this can be a, significance, a significant part of your contribution as well. You could be recommending changes in practice 
uh, changes in policy. So that could be a significant contribution and you have to articulate that. So where do we write about originality and contribution to knowledge in the thesis or dissertation? Well, my argument would be that you do this right from the beginning, when you articulate your problem, purpose, statement and questions. So it begins with the articulation of the problem. The more you write that problem as being in dire need, dire need of being researched, um, the, the more you'll be able to say this was a worthwhile project. So you have to describe that problem as something that is really you know, worthwhile researching, something that we really need to know about. And if you can describe it like that, then when you talk about it later on in your thesis, it's much easier to talk about the contribution. Um, similarly, the knowledge gap. So, so the, the research problem is the real world problem, and the knowledge gap is the academic problem. So the knowledge gap is usually, you know, what the research doesn't know, what the body of research what researchers generally don't know about this topic. Uh, and it could be, you know, they, they don't know about this cohort or this context or this particular issue or this material or whatever it is. If you've articulated it as a significant knowledge gap, then when you come to your final conclusion, you'll be able to say this was a contribution because it was a significant knowledge gap. So you would find this articulation in the introduction chapter. These components would be in place in the introduction chapter where you really emphasize the need for this research in terms of the real world and problems and also in terms of um, scholarly work. Then the next um, thing I would argue is that we develop our contribution all the way through the thesis and we do this through our conclusions. So in the conclusions to sections within a chapter, that's where you're making sense of things for the reader and you can pull out um, significance in those sections. But the conclusion to a chapter, so you know, I'm, I'm always saying to students, you must have a conclusion to a chapter. And at that point they're saying, why? You know, I've, I've just finished this chapter, I want to move on. Why do I have to go over it again? But you need to think like a reader. A reader wants to know at the end of that chapter, what does this mean? And you need to use those conclusions to really pull together. I've told you all of this, but what you need to take from it is this, this, and this. This is the significance of this chapter. So things like, you know, in this study, I intend to extend this argument. That's explicitly saying, this is an important argument and I'm taking it further. So chapter conclusions play a really important role for developing your argument, for showing significance of each chapter, but also of building significance all the way through the thesis. And honestly, you need to make the most of them. Conclusions are where you review the key points of the chapter, but you review them in a way that you are consolidating for the reader the, the most important things and the significance. So in this way, you're building that contribution all the way through the thesis. So pay attention to your conclusions. Then, of course, in the discussion and conclusion chapter, this is where you really press home your contribution to knowledge. And I'm just going to take you through a very brief overview of a chapter. You don't have to follow this, but what I'm saying is look at, look at where I'm kind of emphasizing things here. So you would have an introduction section, and this is where you remind your reader of the problem and the purpose. And again, you can articulate the problem in a way that we really need it to research this. Then have an overview of your study, and this is what you've done up to this point in the study. And this just briefly reminds the reader of why you undertook this endeavor. Then you might have a section where you address the research questions. You don't have to provide solutions because you may not have come up with solutions. But you need to address the research questions. And here you pull together the findings from your data analysis to respond to the research questions. So because you had research questions at the beginning of the project, your readers expecting you to somehow address them in whatever way. And... Um, Doing them explicitly really helps your reader to see that you've addressed those questions. So I suggest to my students that they have the question as a, as a heading 
and then they unpack the findings and they go back to the literature and they say how similar were these um, findings, how different, how have I contributed to closing that knowledge gap. So it doesn't have to be huge, it's degrees of difference, but um, addressing the research questions also helps to build your contribution. And then, of course, developing and discussing the meta-conclusions to the study. And again, I'm suggesting three. So this is where you take a step back. You say, I did this whole study. I came up with these findings. These findings are really significant because of whatever reason. But now, now that I've done the study, what does this mean? What does this mean for, you know, this issue, my practice? What does it mean for, um, you know, I've made this argument how, why was this argument important? So it's that kind of abstraction of your results to meta-conclusions. I hope I'm explaining that properly. <laughs> and then, of course, actually have a section called Significance and Implications with a heading like that. And this is where you really pull out for your readers what the significance and the implications are of your study. And this is where you could say, methodological significance, um, theoretical significance. Um, you may have already covered the others, but you, you, this is where you could pull out some of those other contributions that you're making. And then implications for practice. So um, when you, when you, if this is something that you're going to do, when you give your recommendations, don't just say, this is what I'm recommending. You say it's really important that this gets done or that gets done or this changes so that you're showing the significance as well. So um, you would also have a conclusion to the discussion and conclusion chapter and again you want to make the most of it, pull together the main points, have a key message of the thesis right so that your reader is left with the key message of the thesis. So you don't have to use the headings I've used here and you may have additional sections but what really what I want you to take from this is how you how you articulate your contribution through these different sections. Um, and just a couple of points about writing specifically. So you want to be explicit about the significance. Don't hide it and then hope your reader will read it. So you want sentences like the contribution of the study, the significance of this research. The study adds to the literature in this way. But at, you know, even though I'm telling you to, to really promote your, your study, I, I'm not saying that you need to make unsubstantial claims. What I'm saying is that you must base it on what you've done and on the research and on the literature. So if you are you know, articulating a research problem, you don't want to make unsubstantiated claims. You know, the same with the knowledge gap or even your conclusions. You're always grounding it in the evidence of the study, of you know, the literature, um, of your results, and making the most of it. So Phillips and Pew had some um, really interesting comments, and I'm just going to go through them really quickly. These are just ideas, some of them may be more useful for you because of your particular discipline, and others won't be relevant at all. But I think it's worthwhile just going through them. And maybe they'll generate new ideas for you about how you can articulate your contribution. Setting down a major piece of new information in writing for a first time. Con continuing a previously original piece of work. So you don't have to start something. You can carry, you know, add to it. Carrying out original work designed by a supervisor. So although you haven't um, developed the project, the work is original because it was developed in an original way by someone else. Providing a single original technique, observation or result in an otherwise unoriginal competent piece of research. So it doesn't have to be everything in your project that's original. It could just be one thing that you're contributing. Um, having many original ideas, methods and interpretations. And this could be a team project under your direction, but it's still an original contribution. Showing originality and testing somebody else's idea, using a methodology, using um, a particular research question that's coming from another study. Those can all contribute as well. 
carrying out empirical work that hasn't been done before, making a synthesis that hasn't been done before, using already known material but with a new interpretation, trying out something in one context that has only been done in other contexts before, taking a particular technique and applying it in a new area, and bringing new evidence to bear on an old issue. Being cross-disciplinary and using different methodologies, so anything cross-disciplinary can provide new insight. Looking at areas that people in the discipline hadn't looked at before, adding to knowledge in a way that hasn't been done before. But uh, <laughs> often people will say to me, but actually my study didn't yield anything new at all. And, you know, if your results failed and you, you didn't get what you expected and, and you feel that you really didn't contribute anything in terms of the research results, right, the results didn't yield anything new, that in itself is interesting and useful um, because that could be research that confirms other results or it's research that um, you could comment on and say needs to be changed and developed in particular ways. So you just need to think creatively about how you will um, articulate this contribution. Now, I'm, I'm totally convinced that after doing, you know, a 60,000 to 100,000 word thesis, you will definitely have contributed in some way. It's just a matter of finding it and finding how to write about it. Okay, thank you very much for watching this video and I hope it provided you with something useful. I hope I wasn't too confusing and um, please look out for my other videos on research, thesis and dissertation writing. Bye.